Theranos was one of those Silicon Valley stories that sounded too good to be true. It was going to revolutionize the laboratory testing industry, and it turns out it was too good to be true. John Carreyrou of the Wall Street Journal charted that story about Theranos in his new book, Bad Blood. John, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So let's talk about what Theranos was saying its technology could do and what it was actually doing behind the right. scenes. What, what, what were they selling to the public and investors? Right, so when I started looking into the company in early 2015, they had already gone live with the blood tests for a year and a half. Um, and this they, was in Walgreens, In right? Walgreens yeah. stores. They had rolled out in uh, a couple of Walgreens stores in Ca Northern California and then uh, another 40 or 45 Walgreens stores in the Phoenix area. And uh, the claim was that they had a technology that could run the full range of laboratory tests from just a drop or two of blood pricked from the finger, get you very fast results, and do it at a fraction of the cost of regular laboratories, even cheaper than Medicare. Um, the reality was that uh, Theranos had uh, a prototype uh, that was the last iteration of its device called the Minilab, and that was a, a malfunctioning prototype. Uh, that it was still trying to uh, make work. Uh, and when they had gone live in the fall of 2013, they had gone live with a previous iteration of the technology called the Edison, so named after Thomas Edison, that was actually a very limited machine. It could only do one class of blood tests, known as immunoassays, and it didn't do those tests well. Uh, it was an error-ridden uh, machine. And so for the uh, rest of the tests on the menu, and they had about 250 tests on the menu, they had hacked uh, machines made by the, the German uh, conglomerate Siemens. Uh, they had modified them so that they could accommodate small blood samples. And then there was an, a third bucket of uh, tests that they just did the regular, uh, you know, the old regular way with venous draws, drawing the same amount of blood as everyone else and, and running it also on commercial analyzers. So how does this happen? This is a highly regulated industry here in the US. You would think something like this that was a, mostly smoke and mirrors, wouldn't be able to get past regulators, let alone into a major retail chain like Walgreens. What did Elizabeth Holmes and her colleagues do to sway regulators and sway Walgreens into believing that this should actually be put to use on real patients? Right, so for one thing, they exploited a uh, what I call a regulatory no man's land uh, in the laboratory space. Uh, you have on the one hand the FDA which regulates, reviews, and approves uh, the, the laboratory instruments that labs use, that they buy off the shelf and that they use in their labs. And on the other hand, you have CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is the, the regulator of clinical laboratories. But then there's this, this category of tests known as laboratory developed tests, which are fashioned by labs with their own methods that aren't really regulated by either of these entities. and. Uh, Elizabeth Holmes and her boyfriend Sonny Balwani were able to exploit this third category and, and say, you know, we, we fall in this category of what are known as LDTs because we're using our own proprietary machines within the walls of our own lab. Therefore, we don't have to be reviewed by the FDA, or at least our machines don't have to be reviewed by the FDA. And CMS, which regulates labs, doesn't look closely at LDTs. So that's, that's the... Um, loophole that they were able to exploit. Uh, Theranos had been doing, uh, had been attempting to validate its technology for years with pharmaceutical companies and all these validation studies with big pharma companies had failed. And in early 2010, it was running out of options, so it decided to go straight to consumers. And the way to do that was to uh, ally with a retail partner. And so they started courting Walgreens and they told Walgreens, we've got this great technology, it's portable, it can do all these tests off just a drop of blood, and uh, we want to partner with you. And, and Walgreens was desperate for a new way to reboot growth. And uh, so it started meeting with, with Elizabeth uh, uh, in Palo Alto and in Chicago, where uh, Walgreens is based, and it hired a laboratory consultant named Kevin Hunter uh, to help it do due diligence. And uh, this guy, Kevin Hunter, as I explained in the book, very early on smelled a rat and tried to alert Walgreens executives uh, to his suspicions, and they just wouldn't listen to him. So these tests are being done in Walgreens. You know, they're hyping this technology, cover stories on, on famous magazines and so forth. 
Why weren't we hearing much from the medical community? Or if we were, why did it seem so diminished? Why, why weren't there more flags from peers right. in the industry right. yelling at them? There basically? were whispers in especially the, the field of laboratory science. Uh, but the bottom line is the company was so secretive and uh, very little, if anything, was filtering out of the company itself. So uh, while there were some skeptics in academia and in the field of, of laboratory testing, all they could say was that there was this company that was getting a lot of hype, whose founder you know, was become a, becoming a Silicon uh, Valley celebrity, that at the same time wasn't doing what you usually do in medicine, which is that you publish uh, studies about your innovation, and you publish them in peer-reviewed uh, publications, and you have your peers check what you're doing and verify it. And uh, so there were a couple of laboratory scientists who actually wrote op-eds in, in scientific journals. One of them uh, was Dr. Ioannidis at Stanford who came out with a, a JAMA op-ed in, I believe it was 2015. I'd already started digging into the company at that point. Um, a couple of months later, uh, a uh, laboratory scientist at the University of Toronto, I believe, had another op-ed in another uh, scientific journal. And, um, Which no one reads these, by the way. It's, right, right. it's not right. like the Wall so, Street Journal where everyone's going to see it. It's right. like these so the, nerdy guys just talking yeah. about it. And you know, they 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 started raising alarm bells about the secrecy, about mm -hmm. about the stealth. They called it the stealth research, and and which uh, doesn't happen in this industry. It should be peer reviewed, right? And, right. It should be. Um, it certainly hasn't been the way uh, medical science has has unfolded for the past century. And uh, so, you know, to their credit, they were on the right track. Um, they, didn't, they didn't have the goods in terms of knowing what was actually going on behind the scenes, uh, but uh, they had the right intuition. This story sounds a lot like what we hear from Silicon Valley, that overpromise and underdeliver. Right. You know, we're gonna put out this really cool phone, turns out to be just vaporware. How does that relate to what happened at Theranos? In this case, I think Elizabeth lost sight of the fact that her company wasn't a computer software company. Even though she was running it like that. She was running it like that. Uh, she lost sight of the fact that it was first and foremost a healthcare company, a medical technology company whose product doctors and patients were going to rely on to make crucial health decisions. So and that, if that, a new that's iPhone a, doesn't come out, you're not gonna, it's right. not gonna affect your health. Right. But, and that, that, that's a big part of what went wrong with uh, this story is by, by uh, really draping herself in uh, the, the modus operandi of Silicon Valley, uh, instead of modeling herself after, say, the biotech industry or you know, another corner of the healthcare industry, she, she ended up behaving that way. And while it's okay most of the time to behave that way in traditional tech, it isn't in healthcare.